So uh, I guess we want to start out with trying to identify, you know, how uh, how ham's different from all the other users of radio services. And I think the main thing is it, most radio services, if a user has a radio that isn't making the grade, you know, like they're not making the contacts they need, it's broken or whatever, they just go to the depot, turn it in and get another one. Most of us don't have that luxury. So we kind of have to learn to figure out what's wrong and remedy it ourselves or find some workaround. And uh, that's somewhat unique in the uh, in the radio services. And it's what makes us, I think, as useful as we are in a variety of environments. Um, a lot of hams are, um, they had, like me, I had no engineering background. I was, uh, I was an economics major and then a CPA for uh, 27 years and then a retiree. So uh, never had an electronics class in my life. But you'd be surprised how many things you can fix or remedy or figure out uh, with uh, 50 some years of ham radio under your belt, especially if you if you uh, apply it in a variety of circumstances, whether it emergency communications, the expeditioning, contesting, uh, or whatever it may be. So I basically most of my talks fall into one of five categories. These are the things that I think are important for for hams to know to really have a well-rounded background. And, you know, one is operation of radio equipment and power sources. And uh, we have a number of talks on that. And then operating protocols, whether it's contesting nets, emergency communications, what have you. Uh, understanding propagation and selecting the band and mode that's appropriate for the particular purpose. Um, uh, antennas and feed lines, uh, how they work, building them, installing them, selecting them, putting connectors on, whatever. And then finally, troubleshooting and kind of resolving equipment failures. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, as the title suggests, you do not need an engineering degree. Any ham who's had some time should be able to do at least some of this. And your skills, you'll find, will improve as you do more of it and as you get more time uh, in amateur radio. So here's what you need. Basically, you need a logical approach to the problem. And we'll kind of break some things down uh, on some samples here. I uh, need some basic knowledge, obviously. Some of the questions on our exams uh, are designed to uh, get us to study that uh, basic knowledge, and then you're going to accumulate an awful lot more along the way. Some simple tools and equipment, some of which you uh, are, are actually built into your radios, and others you'll probably find you have sitting around. And finally, some patience and determination to figure out the problem and, and uh, get back to operating. Now, some people think troubleshooting kind of looks like this. Uh, I'll give you a moment to absorb that. But what do we really mean by troubleshooting? Uh, first, you have to recognize that something isn't working correctly. Next, you have to identify what may be the various causes. And notice that's a plural. There's almost always more than one possible cause, sometimes quite a few. Um, you have to isolate and test each possible cause until you find the problem. Um, once you find the root of the problem, um, if you can, you remedy it. If not, you find a workaround. And then finally, you check to make sure things are back to operating normally or at least acceptably. So how do you recognize the problem? Well, you got your five senses, and most of those will come into play somewhere along the line. Uh, you start with what you see or don't see. You don't see lights. You don't see meter movement. Uh, that's an issue. You may hear it or not hear it. Uh, you hear an arc or a buzz or you get no replies or you don't hear any signals or you don't hear anything when you expect to. Um, one of the bad cases is if you smell it, uh, smoke and burning plastic odor. And, and you know, I know hams who can tell what's burning based on the smell of the smoke. Uh, that, that's somebody with a lot of experience. Uh, or somebody tells you, they say, say, there's something wrong with your signal. You got a weak signal, weaker than usual. Uh, you got some sort of hum, you got distortion, uh, your mic's cutting in and out, whatever it may be. Or uh, you get unexpected results from a comparison. You know, you get your brand new receiver and you think, boy, this is going to, I'm going to hear a lot better than the old junker that I've been using. And you put it on the air and, and you don't hear anything and the old one works fine. Well, clearly there's some issue there. So uh, all of these will be clues to you 
that uh, and of course i guess your sense of touch too you know if you feel something that's supposed to be uh, comfortably warm and it's stone cold uh that could be a problem uh if you uh touch an area that should be normal temperature and it's really hot too hot to touch that's usually a problem heat is usually an indication of a big problem at least in properly designed equipment okay so here's some basic concepts uh you follow the flow of power uh, from the source to the end follow the flow of signal from the antenna down into the radio um Make some measurements uh, to confirm the values that you think should be there. And that means knowing what values should be there. This is part of getting to know your equipment. Um, you should have a rough idea uh, which radios uh, stop working below 12 and a half volts when the supply is, is running low. Uh, you should have an idea roughly how much current is required under various conditions for your radios. Um, in fact, I've, I've had a, um, I had an issue um, on a mountaintop. We were running a multi-op uh, VHF contest. We actually ended up, we're one of the top top three multi-multis in the world, uh, in the country rather, for uh, the Jew VHF contest. And I was the microwave guy and all my transverters went down to a, a, a two meter uh, all mode radio that happened to stop listening. All of a sudden you couldn't hear anything. And we couldn't just leave things go. So I unplugged the radio and I had a handheld with me. Normally we'd, we'd use a sideband or CW for our, our uh, microwave contacts. But uh, all I had with me uh, as a spare was a two meter handheld, one of my old Kenwoods. But I happened to know that when you put that on uh, batteries, uh, you know, on the lead acid or uh, rather uh, alkaline batteries, um, it would put out two and a half watts. Well, two and a half watts was just about what the transverters wanted to see. So I just told my uh, my other contacts, I said, everything's going to be FM from now on, on the microwave uh, connections, and uh, was able to use that and uh, finish the contest and make uh, pretty much all the contacts we planned to make. So uh, just knowing that that power level under certain conditions was just what I needed uh, saved the day. Uh, you need to narrow down the location of the problem. Again, just like causes, there's more, typically more than one. Um, and uh, with one exception we'll talk about later, substitute suspected components uh, to see if, uh, uh, or bypass them, in fact, to see if you can uh, uh, re restore uh, operation. Uh, if you can't repair something, find a workaround. What's, what's, what sort of plan B do you have? And you should have one. Uh, and then finally, just check for resumption of normal operations. So let's uh, let's take an example here. Um, you got a radio; it won't turn on. Well, everybody thinks of the first one; <laughs> it's not plugged in. Yes, that's certainly one of the uh, potential problems. But here are quite a few others. First, what's plugged in? Most of our radios these days run off uh, DC, not uh, not uh, shore power. So you have to worry about the supply being uh, getting adequate ac you have to worry about the connection between the supply and the radio um, is the power supply on or off uh, it's easy to kick the switch and uh, you know by mistake and, and have it off especially these uh, supplies with the rocker switches that have the light inside them the lights often burn out but the power supplies are still good so you can't just look down and look for a red light you may have and i've done this i've accidentally kicked the switch on a power supply and turned it off and everything dies. Uh, you may have a bad switch, you may have a blown fuse, you may have the wrong input voltage. Uh, I took uh, my old uh, trusty TS-930 back when that was my contest radio. I uh, took that uh, overseas as I did on uh, various contest expeditions, came back and uh, there was a meeting in the Southern Cal DX Club where somebody had brought a spectrum analyzer and they were gonna look at transmitters and see how, how clean they were. So I brought my 930. Plugged it in, nothing happened. It wouldn't come on. Well, I had switched it over to 230 volts and I'd forgotten to switch it back to 120. Fortunately, it wasn't the other way around. Although I've done that too and don't ask me. Uh, so you could have uh, reverse polarity or you uh, could require uh, some supplies provide uh, AC. You know, it looks like a standard wall wart, but it supplies AC instead of DC because they don't have rectification built in. Uh, could be... Uh, uh, not not all the uh, coaxial power connections have the positive in the middle. Some have the positive on the shell. 
um, you always check those things, uh, you know, look for the labeling and uh, test it if you're not sure. Could have oxidized or broken contacts on the connector. Could have a wire broken or loose inside the device or inside the connector. Um, could have insufficient current or voltage available to the device. We had situations, all of these, where we were able to diagnose something. A friend of mine uh, was putting together a new VHF rover, and he uh, had all power poles providing uh, the uh, connections to uh, the from the DC in the in the car to his rig rigs, and uh, one of the rigs wouldn't come on. All the others were and couldn't figure it out. Everything looked fine. We kind of traced things around. So finally, I pulled the uh, pulled the Anderson power pole on the end of the uh, supply line for this particular radio and looked into it. And I found that one of those contacts, you know, these things, they go like this and, and uh, the contacts only go in one way. Well, they went in the other way. He put it in backwards. And so one of the contacts was pointed up and not toward the mating connector. So uh, unfortunately, once that's crimped on and everything, you kind of have to cut it off. So we just started over, put a brand new connector on there, and everything worked fine. Uh, as far as uh, wire uh, loose inside the, the device, um, uh, had an Astron supply, normally pretty reliable, uh, wouldn't wouldn't provide any turn on, but wouldn't provide any output. So I opened the thing up and found that one of the wires that's supposed to be going to the uh, the output, uh, the bolts uh, the, for the output connector was sitting there dangling in midair. Well, apparently the factory uh, had failed to put a lock washer on the thing. It worked loose. There was a nut lying in the bottom of and this and this uh, piece of wire with the lug on it was just dangling in midair. So we hooked that back up, put a lock washer on it. That took care of that. Uh, insufficient current or voltage. Um, went to visit a uh, Boy Scout camp where they had a, a, a VHF radio up in the it was up in the mountains. And uh, and he said, yeah, every time I hit the transmit, the uh, you know the the thing everything turns off. Okay, well, we obviously suspected the supply, and I took a look. Now, this was a typical, uh, you know, 50-watt mobile, which normally draws around 10 amps or so, and he was running it from a uh, an Astron 10-amp supply. Well, he didn't realize that 10 amps is the peak rating on those supplies. They're not, uh, th that's the intermittent rating. It's not the continuous rating, and continuous rating on typical supply is about 70% uh, of the peak rating. And so, you know, FM, of course, is a 100% duty cycle mode. So when you hold it down, you're, you're having it deliver all the current it, it can deliver. And that just wasn't enough, and it was shut down. Uh, so once we got a bigger supply, that took care of the problem. Uh, and that knowledge came in useful later when we were running a, working a, uh, the Baker to Vegas race, which is a 100-mile, 120-mile race across the desert uh, relay with the law enforcement. And uh, one of my duties as the stage lead for communications was to go check on the medical radio network uh, and the folks that uh, were providing the medical services at that stage. They were using commercial radios, but uh, I wanted to go check and make sure it was right. Have you done run any tests? No, we haven't. So they hook everything up and they they uh, hit the mic and I said, let's let's check in with uh, check in with dispatch and make sure they can hear you. And uh, they hit the mic and the thing would go dead. Well, gee, where have I seen that before? So I looked and they were using a, a little, uh, you know, a, a solar generator type, but one of the early, early versions. Um, and uh, they didn't realize that that thing can't deliver that much current. So I had them run a, run a cable out to somebody's car behind the uh, first aid tent, uh, plug into their, uh, their battery and leave their engine idling and uh, then we had plenty of current for them and that worked out fine. So we've got our radio, okay, won't happen, uh, won't work, what do we do? Well, first we start tracing the wiring to and from each of the devices and the power supply. We check the voltage at the radio and if it's not adequate, we work back toward the supply and you know where did it disappear? Uh, you check that power supply polarity, the output and in input voltage settings, we wiggle all the power connectors looking for intermittents. Uh, I had my my first my first real computer was an Apple IIe way back in decades ago, and I used it to to track STS nine when the Owen Garriott was up there on the space shuttle and all that. We did all sorts of stuff with it, but um, 
uh, every once in a while, it would just shut off and reboot by itself. And I couldn't figure that out. Well, it turns out the uh, standard uh, power cord that, that comes with these things, in this case, had a bunch of extra rubber flashing in it. And when you when you touched it at all, it didn't make solid contact. So any little bump and the thing would reset. And that had gone on for a year or so. I didn't realize it uh, till I started reaching by and wiggling things. And sure enough, it went right off. Took it, took a look, close look at it, was able to get in there after unplugging it, of course, with a knife blade, clear out that rubber, and then everything worked fine. Um, clean the contacts uh, or uh, uh, replace the contacts if necessary, if a connector is suspect. Um, uh, it, the stuff I use for that is uh, made by CAIG, C-A-I-G, called Deoxit. There are several uh, similar sounding products, but they're all just, you know, volatile organic chemical type cleaners. Uh, Deoxit does not use VOCs, and it provides not only a cleaning action, but also it leaves a, a, a surface film that prevents further oxidation. Great stuff. I know the audio guy, professional audio guys use it. Uh, I've used it to solve a number of problems. Um, open the lid of the radio or the power supply. Look for dangling wires. Um, uh, try a different power supply um, and cable uh, one at a time. If you have a good deep cycle battery, it's not it's good not only for emergency communication, but it's also really good as a uh, backup power supply and uh, a test supply. And we'll talk about how that can come into play later. All right, so um, assuming the, all that has worked out so far, now you got to look at the audio chain. Uh, first question is, do you don't hear any signals or you don't hear anything at all? If you don't hear anything at all, you got to suspect the uh, the audio chain. Uh, many um, Many radios have uh, like an automatic an internal speaker and an automatic disconnect to that speaker when you plug in a headphones or an external speaker and usually that's a, just a simple pair of contacts that open up when you when you put a plug into the uh, into the speaker jack or the headphone jack and uh, those contacts can sometimes uh, get oxidized so if you pull it out and it doesn't make good contact well you got no speaker so uh <clears throat> Plug in some headphones, see if uh, that changes the situation. Pretty much tells you it's probably that uh, that uh, internal switch in your in your headphone jack. Um, you may have the squelch or the RF gain set incorrectly. Um, if radio, not all radios uh, uh, use uh, you know automatic uh, squelch. Uh, there may be some some setting. Uh, one of my uh, one of my oh, my former roommate, in fact, he's. Uh, uh, all, he's a member of the CQ Contest Hall of Fame in 6TR. We had a mutual friend who had a, who was a, a good engineer, and he had a radio that uh, was a nice a Kenwood TR7400, for those of you who remember those. Uh, very nice, robust radio with helical, uh, helical coil filters and everything. Very robust for its day. And on the VHF, and unfortunately, he said he you know it would not it want to hear anything. He never got a heard, and the audio seemed to be you know. No, nothing worked so he sold it to my to my friend for a, a, a very nominal amount so uh larry took a look at it and saw that the uh the uh squelch setting was it was set for tone squelch receive uh and of course you know the stuff he was listening for didn't have that tone so clicks it over one notch everything works fine so of course he couldn't help but rubbing it in a little bit uh for the deal he got um you could have no antenna or the wrong antenna connected. Um, you know, when all all coaxes and all power cables look alike, uh, if they're not labeled, you could have something connected on there that's not working. Uh, if um, you could have a shorter open in the transmission line or in the connector, um, could be on the wrong frequency. Uh, if if you're uh, you're trying to key up a repeater and you don't have it set up, or maybe you don't have the PL set up correctly. Um, could be on a dead band. You get your brand new receiver and you say, oh, good. Uh, now I'm, I'm a tech and I can finally get on HF. I, I know 10 meters, we have some stuff and it's two in the morning uh, in the middle of the winter and you, you jump on uh, 10 meters and you listen around, oh, I don't hear anybody. Well, you know, 10 meters at two in the morning isn't going to do much typically. So uh, understand 
where you should be looking for signals. So what are we going to do that? Uh, well, we're going to first uh, turn the RF gain up full, make sure the squelch is off, take the volume down halfway or less so you don't blast yourself out once you solve the problem. Plug in some headphones and then check the external speaker. Uh, uh, stick a length of wire in the antenna jack just to see if it makes a difference from no antenna at all. And by the way, uh, a banana plug, standard banana plug, is a perfect fit for the uh, for the center pin socket of a, a UHF connector. So uh, you, you keep a little uh, hunk of wire with a banana plug on it, shove it back there, and there's your temporary antenna. And you see if the signal, the noise noise level goes up or down. Uh, you could substitute another length of coax if you think coax is bad. Uh, tune to a, a known active band or frequency, I mean, WWV, for example, where they're going 24-7, or a, a, a repeater that's very, very busy. Um, look at any switches and other meters and other accessories you have out of the line. Had a friend who'd just gotten his HF set up and, and was complaining that you know he couldn't hear anything at all on HF, no signals of any kind. So I had him describe to me over the phone the everything between the uh, antenna and the radio. And in fact, uh, he had a, a, a coax switch he'd acquired in there so he could switch between two antennas. And so I said, well, take the antenna cable, take the switch out of the line, take the meter out, out of the line, plug it directly into the back of the radio. Boom, that took care of the problem. Um, so he had a bad switch. And of course, you know, most people assume that a new switch is going to work fine, but um it's always good to uh take that out and and you know test it first um if you have a second receiver even if it's just a scanner listen on the same antenna if you're hearing a lot of signals that suggests the problem is not with the antenna if you don't that suggests maybe there's an antenna issue and uh i found the antenna issues including you know you had a windstorm and you go out and, you know you check into your net and well the swr is terrible and you go out and your antenna is lying on the ground or half of it's lying on the ground. So um, there's a there's a clue for you. All right, uh, let's go to another problem. Somebody reports that you have a distorted signal. Well, assuming your transmitter is OK, there are all sorts of possibles here. First is you may be overdriving or mishandling the microphone. Um, radios vary a lot in their sensitivity to voice. Uh, we know some that are very hot on the mic and some are uh, don't have much of a preamp many of them especially the uh the vhf uhf ones don't have a way to adjust the mic gain so uh you know you also we have people who are big big booming voices and you have some that are very quiet and kind of timid on the air they don't speak they speak very quietly and uh same radio can't handle all of those at once in the same way uh, so at a minimum, you're probably going to need to adjust your microphone usage, have somebody report to you when you get your new radio. Uh, how's my audio? That's you notice I do this even here on, on uh, Rat Pack. Um, check the audio uh, to make sure something hasn't gone wrong. But simply by holding the mic closer, further away, you can adjust for a voice that may be louder or softer than quote unquote normal. Um, you may find that mics are very, some of the, especially hand mics are sensitive to uh, uh, the plosives, you know, the P's and the S's and stuff. And if you simply turn the microphone sideways and talk across it instead of into it, you can uh, reduce a lot of those and it'll be much more uh, clean sounding on the other end. Uh, you could have a loose connection in the microphone. I've had that happen listening on a second receiver and I can hear it jumping in and out, uh, pull the thing apart. It was a, a headset. And I realized that one of the connections to the uh, element, the mic element inside the uh, the boom mic had come loose. So solder that back together and that took care of it. Um, you could have your audio misadjusted. Uh, some radios, especially HF ones, come with various, you know, processing and uh, compression and so on. I tell people usually, I, I never run that stuff. I mean, they say, well, you know, it'll be more intelligible on the other end. But I, I don't use the processing. I don't use compression. Turn all that stuff off and just have nice, clean audio. Um, on FM, it's possible the deviation is misset, although that's that's usually pretty rare. It's not a menu type item. So unless there was some, uh, you know, unless it's a used radio that somebody screwed around with, that's unlikely to be an issue. 
Uh, you could have RF feedback due to uh, stray feed line currents, and we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, you could be off frequency. I know people who bump the knob, and instead of uh, you know 146.52, they're on 146.525. Well, uh, on wideband FM, that's enough that people can still hear you, but it's going to sound really goofy. Um, it's it's going to sound off. You know, if you're off five kilohertz on sideband, you're just not there. If you're off uh, five kilohertz on FM, you may be there, but sound uh, broken up. So, you know, double check that frequency. And sure enough, we had several times people said, oh, I bumped the knob. Okay. And then they're back on. Everything's good. Could have bad ground or a ground loop. Uh, may have other noisy uh, RF noisy devices on the same AC line or nearby. Um, so these are all uh, possible causes that are on your end. There is actually a possible cause that's on the other end. And we'll get to that in a second. Uh, so as we said, talk across, not into the mic, uh, shake or tap your mic and listen on a second receiver, uh, turn off your processor, reduce the mic gain, adjust your voice level and the distance from the mic, uh, measure the power supply voltage under load, uh, a sideband radio with an inadequate power supply or too much volt, you know, too long of power cord and voltage drop, uh, will st often start to FM. And I've heard this on uh, microwave things where somebody's got a, a long DC run up to their transverter and dish at the top of the mast. And uh, the transverter, even while it's only a few watts, uh, can be pulling that power supply voltage because there's so much loss in the cable. And, and, and it sounds, well, you go to FM and that solves the problem, but temporarily, uh, and we've done that, but the source of the problem is too much voltage drop. Um, either put the power supply up close to the trans transverter or just get some more copper, get bigger bigger cable and run it up there so you don't have that uh, cable loss. Uh, you, everybody should have a dummy load or two or several. Uh, transmit it to a dummy load and listen on a second receiver. Uh, what's that gonna do for you? Well in addition to allowing you to run some various tests without bothering people on the air. Remember we said earlier that you could have RF feedback. Well, if you're transmitting into a dummy load, uh, there's no RF coming out the antenna upstairs to uh, to get back on the shield and come back at you. So uh, uh, if, if it's clean into a dummy load and not into the antenna, that suggests that maybe you have an RF feedback problem. We'll talk about dealing with that. Um, Make sure you disconnect to turn off all the other radios and accessories, pull all the extra cables off, strip it down to its bare minimum and see if it works then. And then if you start adding things back, uh, you may see, you may find the problem. Um, you know, have somebody on the other end, listen up or down a few kilohertz. If you're on FM and see if, uh, uh, see if that's the problem. Um, and unplug any other uh, stuff that's in your, in your, on your line, uh, hour in the radio, just clean it completely up and then start adding things back as you need to. Um, now, I mentioned here all these possible problems that are in your shack, but it could be somebody on the other end. Uh, assuming you're not overdriving any stage or, or uh, you, know, you otherwise have a clean signal that you can hear yourself, um, ask the other operator first uh, if they have their noise blanker on. Uh, you know, sometimes they have it on for some passing vehicle or something and they forget to turn it back off and everything sounds fine until they get a strong signal. And the noise blanker, since it samples uh, stuff outside the pass band and then chops up the desired signal, it can it can make a strong signal sound really choppy. So make sure their noise blanker is off. Um, if they have some, uh, if they have a, a preamp on, which typically you don't need on the certainly not on the lower bands maybe you get up on 10 meters if your radio isn't too hot you might need that but for the most part you don't need preamps down on 80 40 20 and so on uh I suggest they turn that off uh if they have some ability to put some attenuation in there uh, uh try that you know stick 10 db of attenuation in and sometimes that'll clear it up if, if they're close to you if you're running a, you know pretty good power uh, you could simply be overloading their receiver not all receivers are as robust as the ones that uh, uh, we like to use for, you know, for contesting and DXing and so on. And if you got a receiver that kind of crumps when you when you hit hit it with too much RF, that could be part of the problem too. So bear in mind, it's it's not always your 
issue. All right, we've talked about RF feedback and the general rule for RF, it goes wherever you let it go. And so let's see how we can kind of control that. Um, every system component is subject to, you know, stray RF. Could be radiated RF, it could be conducted RF. Uh, power supplies, you got input and output cables, you got the wall wiring, you've got other radios, antennas, uh, power ports, computers, uh, data modems, audio leads, um, you know, connected to your computer, routers, and so on. These things can generate RF, and they're also susceptible to RF. You know, uh, back uh, about uh, 15 years ago, uh, ARL was fighting against uh, broadband over power line. And of course, you know, every wire is an antenna, right? So, and uh, 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 power lines miles and miles long are really, really big antennas. And you put the data over that on HF and it can uh, it could cause a mess. So that was definitely a bad idea. Fortunately, I think it died it died from uh, a lack of a lack of proper design. Uh, not amateur gear, of course, uh, you know, the old the old days, everybody complained about interfering with somebody's TV or stereo. Um, uh, TVs have typically broad front ends, a good uh, front end filter for that. I was able to cure neighbors problems way back when. Uh, stereos, you've got antennas, speakers, power leads running all over the house. They're all antennas. Um, garage door openers, you got wire controls. Uh, our uh, former section manager in LA had a new, got a new uh, alpha amplifier, got on the air, he had a nice station. And whenever he transmitted on 20 meters, the garage door opened. Well, turns out the wiring from the garage door controller to the, uh, the, the switches was a quarter wavelength on 20 meters and just picked that stuff up perfectly. So um, he uh, changed the wiring, put in some little ferrites, and that took care of the problem. Telephones and intercoms, again, uh, at least the, the hardwired telephones are uh, connected to a lot of wire around the house. They can pick stuff up. Uh, there are there are uh, ferrites and filters you can use for that. Uh, automotive electronics. Uh, I was very careful when I bought my uh, Forerunner back many years ago. That's my, my main roving vehicle uh, to uh, bring a bunch of radios and uh, drive around the parking lot uh, activating things and transmitting and checking to see if my radio affected the automotive uh, braking and stuff and checking to see whether all the uh, all the apparatus on the uh, on the car and it had any interference interference with the uh, the radios unfortunately everything was clean and it's worked out really nicely okay as we said every cable's an antenna uh, it can be uh, a, an unfortunate length in particular, but even if it's not, it can pick up a lot of RF. Uh, the longer the cable, the lower frequency it's going to respond to. Uh, good ferrite chokes can stop most common mode RF. That is stuff that's flowing on, on all the conductors. And uh, I'll show you some examples of those. Uh, your inductive reactance rises uh, linearly. If you use those beads that you slip onto your coax, you put on twice as many beads, you get twice as much inductive reactance. But if you use a toroid, uh, just like any transformer, uh, the inductance goes up as the square of the number of turns. So if you have three turns, that's you know a certain amount of uh, uh, inductive reactance. But you put on six turns, now it's four times that much. Um, Jim Brown, K9YC, has a good, uh, a good write-up uh, after a lot of research on making uh, these chokes. And in fact, Jim's going to be a guest of ours in a couple of weeks on Rat Pack, talking specifically about uh, making chokes for antennas to keep RF off. So I encourage you to come and watch the calendar. It's going to be, uh, I think, uh, either uh, uh, one or two weeks, uh, two or three weeks from tonight. Here are some examples for uh, chokes. Uh, the kind I build is over here on the left. Uh, these are uh, FT243 size, they're about 2.4 inches in outside diameter and over an inch inside. Uh, and this is a mix 31. There are several different mixes of ferrites. Each one responds to a different range of frequencies. Uh, type 75, I think, is good for uh, broadcast band up through low HF. 
Uh, there's a type 61 that's good for BHF and UHF. Type 31 is good basically from HF through uh, about two meters. So that's really the best choice. I'm winding that with uh, RG400, which is a kilowatt capable coax, but it's small enough about, about the size of RG58 that you can get the necessary number of turns around. And again, uh, Jim uh, K9YC's uh, uh, online documentation and his presentation in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about how the uh, how to make these for different bands and so on. Uh, here's some cat cable, cat five cable wrapped around. Here's some flat telephone cable. Um, these things do a really nice job of, of trapping RF. And if you don't feel like making these yourself, by the way, uh, there are a number of places uh, uh, that make them. Uh, this These happen to be made by uh, KF7P, who has a commercial uh, antenna business up north. So uh, how are we going to find out how RF is getting in? Well, first, uh, try power from an alternate power source. Remember that deep cycle battery I told you about? That's definitely something you want to you wanna try because... What that does is eliminate the possibility that RF is getting in through the either the AC wiring in your in your shack or through the power supply itself or the cables from the power supply to the radio. Um, <clears throat> route your RF cables separately from the others. Um, there's a tendency to bring all everything together in, in a conduit or what have you. Um, one of my good friends, W4EF um, uh, from uh, JPL, uh, used to go out in the desert before he got his, his permanent place. And he'd run the 160 meter contests in the winter from his truck. And he'd set out a pair of Honda generators and he ran his alpha or his uh, Drake L7 amplifier. And uh, it got pretty cold out there at night. So he had all the cables coming in through one window in his truck, but, and he built some really nice filters, line filters for the, uh, for the uh, pair of Honda generators, a pair of EU 2000s, which are not, not that bad. They're pretty quiet usually. But uh, he kept, he continued to get this interference. And finally, he realized that it must have been leaking between the coax and the AC cables. So he took the AC cable from the generator, ran it the other side of the vehicle and brought it in a different window. And that solved the problem completely. Um, so uh, try a good AC line filter. I've had that solve a problem. Uh, I had a, a keyer that would go off whenever I was transmitting on a certain band. So I took, uh, well, I use the trip light isobars. They're uh, uh, not only good isolation from the line, but also if you have multiple banks, uh, each bank is RF isolated from the, from the bank before it. So I plugged uh, my uh, transceiver in one, uh, in one outlet. And then I went to the other end of the isobar and I put the keyer in that one. So there was some RF isolation between the two, solve the problem. Uh, you know, pull the various leads. If a problem stops, then you found your problem. Use ferrites on that lead. Um, uh, as we said, replace the antenna with a dummy load. Uh, so that means uh, you're not sending any RF up the coax and therefore no RF down the coax. And if it's a problem when you're running on the antenna and not when you're on the dummy load, that suggests you need some uh, you need to do some uh, uh, some RF uh, choking uh, along your feed line, preferably starting at the feed point of the antenna. Uh, use good filters. They're high pass, low pass, band pass, notch filters. You can make you can make uh, band uh, band pass filters from uh, from coax in certain cases on harmonic bands. Uh, we cover that in our. Uh, our talks on field day, you can go back to about a week before field day. Anthony and I did some talks on last minute preparation. And I also did a talk separately on Rat Pack about minimizing interstation interference. And we talked there about making uh, band pack, making uh, filters out of uh, uh, coax stubs. Um, uh, try, you know, try different bands to see if the... Um, if the cable problem is only on one particular band, there may be a resonant length somewhere. Uh, if you have a, a an antenna, you can turn turn it to a different direction, away from the house or whatever. See if that makes a difference. These are all things you can try to see if you can stop the RF from coming in. We said you need some test equipment. Uh, there's stuff you already have. A lot of radios have metering built in. I know my K3, I can look at the uh, PA temperature, front panel temperature. 
uh, uh, voltage and current and so on, uh, just as an as a uh, menu choices for the meter. Uh, a lot of radios, uh, even the uh, you know the simple FM mobile transceivers, when you first turn them on, you may get a quick voltage reading before it goes to the frequency display. That's very useful um, because that tells you the, how much voltage is getting to the uh, to the board itself inside the radio. That's taking into account all the connectors and power supplies and everything. Uh, have some sort of second radio or handheld, even a scanner for that band so that you can you can listen to yourself and hear what's going on. Um, have some spare coax cables, known good cables, known good power cords. Uh, never hurts to have spares, and that allows you to do some substitution. Uh, if you got a vehicle battery and jumper cables, there's a temporary power source that you can try if you're suspecting a problem with your with your uh, 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 AC based power supply and and by the way you know big deep cycle batteries are nice because um they can deliver an awful lot of current so you know you don't have to worry about uh if i need uh, 10 amps and my supply delivers 7 well your battery will give you all you need at least on a short term basis for testing uh portable am receiver you know the old transistor radios uh, if you got one of the little aircraft band receivers which aircraft band is AM. AM is really good for noise tracking um, because it's responsive to, uh, it's responsive obviously to amplitude, which is most pulse noise. Uh, so you can use that uh, as one as one particular tool. Uh, don't look for noise with your FM handheld. Um, I, was, uh, I was asked to come and take a look at an installation ongoing at the LA City's Emergency Operations Center uh, for HF back when they were building it many years ago. And I asked the contractors, I said, have you, you know, there's a lot of HVAC equipment, you know, air conditioning and stuff on the roof. Have you checked for noise before you sighted this uh, antenna, this, this uh, uh, dipole? And they said, yeah. I said, what, did you use your FM radios? Yes. I said, well, that won't do any good because your FM radios are designed to ignore amplitude modulation, amplitude the changes. So you can't hear the noise on your FM radio. That's why FM was, was designed so that people before a uh, spark, uh, you know, spark noise uh, ignition systems got quieted down. Uh, that's how you were able to hear it without constantly uh, getting uh, spikes from all the cars driving by you. So we had to educate them a little. They they know how to make money, but they didn't understand the uh, the RF side of things. So get some more basics: uh, clip leads, lengths of wire, coax jumpers, adapters. Um, have a, a simple uh, volto milliameter. You can use a really cheap one um, from uh, Harbor Freight or something. If you're talking about low voltages, I wouldn't want to use one of those for, for uh, you know, AC or any high voltage stuff, but certainly for, um, for checking for 12 volts and stuff like that, you, you're good. Um, your dummy load, as we said, it's not just for tuning up. Um, simple hand tools. Uh, you know, screwdrivers, pliers, nut drivers, uh, um, wire cutters, um, and eventually you'll add, uh, like some of us, you'll add a lot. Um, you know, you get, uh, well, I'll need some, uh, some uh, metric uh, hex wrenches, some uh, SAE hex wrenches, so you can open things up and, and access things and check them out. A good RF watt meter, an SWR bridge is kind of a relative indicator, but a good RF watt meter is very useful. You know, we get a you can get a used Bird Forty Three for a reasonable price and uh, get the slugs that uh, the inserts that apply to your uh, bands of interest and your power levels. Um, they can be very very uh, useful in getting absolute measurements, uh, like at both ends of the coax. You can actually measure the loss on your coax by looking at the RF on each end of it. Uh, good ferrite cores, spare fuses. A soldering kit, uh, all these things can help out. Um, as we mentioned earlier, I just want to emphasize, get to know what's normal. Uh, you know, if you if you don't know what normal is for a radio, look through the manual, do some measurements uh, so you get an idea what to expect. And that will that will set your uh, that will kind of calibrate your senses to when something isn't going right. Uh, remember that any problem may have more than one cause. A uh, good friend of mine, um, actually pretty technical guy, uh, uh, was uh, uh, he had an old 
modified sine wave inverter, you know, to transfer you go from DC to AC. And he see it, saw a nice circuit in QST that on how to con build it as a uh, a true sine wave inverter. He said, I want to do that. So he did. He built it very nicely. And he said, okay, I'm going to test it. So he, uh, he he's there in his apartment and he he brings out his old oscilloscope, an old Tektronics oscilloscope. He said, okay, I'm going to look at this waveform. So he hooks everything up, turns it on, beautiful sine wave waveform. He's just happy as a clam. And all of a sudden he smells smoke. Now, when you're in an apartment, you don't want to be setting off the smoke alarms. That makes you very unpopular at a minimum. Um, and so he frantically unplugged the, uh, the inverter that he just made, but the smoke kept coming. Well, turns out it was his old oscilloscope. <laughs> they had a, had a bad, uh, bad capacitor in the power supply. So, uh, you know, the thing you think it is isn't necessarily what the problem is. So don't jump to conclusions. Uh, be systematic about it. And we talked about substitution, you know, substitute a piece of coax, substitute a switch, whatever. The only caution there is um, if you have a, a high value component like a receiver or something uh, in the line, um, don't substitute that until you have resolved all the power issues and confirmed that the power is not the issue. Because what you don't want is to have, say, a power supply that's, you know, set way wrong on voltage and uh, it it blew up your radio and now you put a brand new radio on there and you blow that one up too. So uh, make sure you check all the voltages before you substitute something like a second receiver. Um, as we said before, coaxes and all that red and black uh, zip cord can look similar uh, using labels of some sort, you know, label maker, um, uh, you know, paper and tape, whatever it is. Label that stuff so that you know which thing you're plugging or unplugging, which coax is for which band. Uh, those labels can help uh, uh, trace problems and uh, diagnose things. So, you know, tackle stuff. And by the way, uh, hams are really good about helping other other hams. Uh, I know some people are, are you know very, very generous with their time and helping, helping you trace down a problem. But I know a few, one or two folks their first reaction is to call somebody else. And, you know, that gets wearing after a while. If, if you call somebody for help and they can say, well, you can say, well, here's what I've already done. I've tried A, B, C, and D. They know at least you've given a shot at it and they'll probably be more likely to give you a hand and help you diagnose the rest of the problem. Uh, and as I said before, you know, when something goes wrong, you'll, you'll learn from it and you'll keep track of that for the future. And that knowledge accumulates over time. So that will get you uh, a long way and pretty soon people are going to be calling you for help. So that's that's the presentation. So let's stop and see what sorts of questions people have. And let's see whether uh, we have some additional uh, suggestions and input from our engineering friends. Okay, we're op okay. It looks like uh, Gene's got his hand up. Go ahead, Gene. Yeah, hey, uh, so far this has been a fantastic presentation. A uh, good reminder about stuff that I should have already have known, but I've forgotten over time. My question is, when I was in the military, I worked telecommunications, radio shelters, switching shelters, all that kind of stuff. And one of the common problems, regardless of whether it was my equipment or somebody else's equipment, was the concept of a floating ground. But nobody ever explained to us what that is, how to look for it, and how to either prevent it or fix it. Mm. Uh, well, of course, um, you, you know, we've got some really good reference material out there, uh, starting with uh, Ward Silver N0AX's uh, grounding and bonding for the radio amateur. That's a very good reference. And, you know, uh, another one is uh, another of Jim Brown, Canine YC, our, our upcoming speakers. Uh, his, he's a professional audio engineer, and uh, he talks about, you know, the, the pin one problem with the uh, XLR cables, and he talks about, uh, you know, grounding and, and ground loops and things like that. So there's a lot of good reference material out there, and it's certainly worth looking at. In, in Ward's case, the emphasis is uh, safety from uh, pulse like, you know, lightning and so on. Um, where you keep try to keep everything at the same chassis potential because when current flows, it's because 
there's a different potential from from one uh, piece of equipment Message to another. For me, not sure what I can do. I simply open the gate on Wednesdays. Okay, there's some something going on on the side here. All right, I think we got that. Okay, other suggestions, questions, comments. Victor had a question in the chat. Does the ground plug make a difference on a 120 wall socket? Because he said uh, people pile them down or cut them off. Do, okay, uh, does it make a difference? Well, it's it's a, that's a safety issue mainly. It's not an RF issue. I mean, remember, you know, RF sees all all wire is an inductor as well as being an antenna, and uh, long thin wires uh, are not good RF grounds at all. They are uh, they're just big old inductors and most of the RF won't flow over a long skinny uh, piece of wire. So that's why that's why you go back to Ward's book and you look at you know copper ground rods and and uh, copper flashing or plate underneath the, the equipment and big wide braids provide low inductance connections from one piece of equipment to another. Uh, but uh, you know as far as cutting off uh, uh, the the ground pin of an AC, uh, that's there for safety reasons and uh, absolutely not recommended. Okay. That's everything in chat. There's some good questions and comments in chat, but nothing we can need right now. Okay. For you, Barry. Anybody got Thanks, their hand? Go ahead, Marty. No, I just say, uh, I'm thanking Barry. Any, anything else from anybody? Great presentation. I like your slides. Uh, yeah, is certainly there's some questions out there. Uh, are there any uh, comments in the chat thing that you want to tell us about, Barry? Well, I made a comment about if you if you have headphones plugged in, and when you unplug them, you hear sound. You want to try to plug plug, plug the headphones in one at a time. If not, the problem is with the headphones and not with the radio. I've seen that multiple times happen where people just aren't getting sound out of their radio headphones and when you unplug them the sound comes out but they can't believe that their headphones are broken so sometimes they're <laughs> loose and you just have to plug them in really well to be able to get the sound yeah uh, that that's the reverse of the problem i was describing earlier with that internal switch <laughs> and don't use the sense of taste to, to test any electronic components no. although okay. a lot of times they used to do that to test nine volt batteries. nine volt batteries yeah <laughs> but uh, but not uh, not anything bigger than that. <laughs> okay, Jeannie, get your hand up again. Take her away. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, next question is, I've been out to a number of ham fests over the years. And of course, there's a section that sells uh, used equipment, somewhat recently used, somewhat very uh, boat anchor type. Now, obviously, I can't go in there with oscilloscopes and other high-tech uh, test equipment. What would you recommend? How, how can I test something at a bench in a great big building that doesn't have any power cables or even antenna cables going to the equipment they're trying to sell? Well, uh, especially for old stuff that requires plugging into AC, unless somebody nearby has a generator, uh, you're going to kind of have to... Uh, uh, make sure that it's it's a a seller that you know or that somebody else knows and you know get a get some sort of agreement as to you know what the condition is represented to be um uh you know the uh the online forums have various uh, feedback mechanisms for people who sell stuff that isn't as represented but we are at a swap meet now i i do remember one one place where uh one swap meet where some guy set up a uh his generators and had some basic test equipment uh, so that people could check things out. But uh, if you have, I mean, at least if you bring a, a small meter and maybe a screwdriver, look inside, see what things look like, uh, that can give you a clue as to how well the equipment has been maintained and so on, or, you know, whether the tubes are all there, if it's really old equipment, stuff like that. Uh, but you're, you're not going to be able to necessarily test the performance of everything. Now, I will say there are some very nice new um, miniaturized and not too expensive uh, RF tools. Uh, you know, the little nano VNA, uh, you've got the, the little R 
RF finder type uh, signal generators and mini spectrum analyzers that are about the size of the old iPods. And uh, with a couple of cables and adapters, you could actually, for example, run run signal through a uh, a filter or a switch or something and see what sort of loss you're see what sort of uh, band pass you're, you've got. So passive components, you you can definitely test if you want to bring a couple of pieces of equipment like that. Um, but you know, you're not going to be plugging in, uh, you know, a, a Johnson a Valiant transmitter and and uh, checking it all out in in the field. It's always uh, best to do, you know, if you know the guy or you know somebody that you trust that knows the guy, that helps a lot too. Goes a yep. long ways. Yep. And sometimes uh, sellers will say, "Look, you know, you can come pick it up at my house, and we'll show you. We'll let you demonstrate, see it, see that it's working." Uh, before before it leaves and same same goes when you're selling something you know you don't want something that you've taken really good care of somebody takes it and either trashes it or substitutes components and then complains that you sold them a lemon so that protection goes both ways okay anybody else out there all righty sounds like you've uh, been there done that with a lot of this stuff marty Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it's over 20 contest expeditions around the world. And sometimes you're places where there are no spare parts. <laughs> you're on your own. And uh, I had the same thing happen in some uh, MCOM deployments. You know, you you realize that there's a problem and, and you don't have somebody else. You just got to figure it out. And uh, and as I said, have a plan B. You know, if 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 one thing isn't working, what else do you have that can make the make the task uh, uh, achievable? One other suggestion, if you're going to be working on modern electronics, be sure you ground yourself for going inside the chassis of any of that stuff, because we have static electricity in our fingers and we can accidentally let the magic smoke out of the components if we're not properly grounded. Absolutely. I've got a I've got a static mask and a risk strap and all that that I use when I'm working on my uh, K3, uh, you mm -hmm. know, because I, I, I built it and, uh, you know, whenever I got an, a... Uh, an accessory for it, I would open it up and, and install it. So always keep yourself uh, yeah, grounded. These these wrist straps have a very high, you know, couple of mega ohm resistor in there. It's enough to drain off static charges, but not enough to electrocute you. So uh, good good suggestion. And you tell us some stories on that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, it's been a good presentation. Um, tune in tomorrow night, Thursday. We're going to do something different. Tomorrow, uh, what I want to do is I want to make you, the presenters, be part of the planners. We're going to uh, move around a lot of ideas and suggestions and see what y'all got in your mind there, what, what we can generate out there. Uh, so that's for tomorrow night. And I look forward to talking to you guys. See you then. Uh, if there's all right, I'll say 73. Everybody have a good evening. Thank you all for coming. Bye-bye.